Welcome back to the pod house. We're sitting here with the amazing Nick Crocker who flew in from Melbourne just this morning um, for the Sunrise Festival and is joining us on the pod this afternoon. Yeah, would love to say you flew in just for us, but <laughs> it's actually Blackbird Sunrise Festival this week. No, um, it's for this sunrise of the bonus. This is why I'm here. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Um, really exciting festival. There's going to be thousands of people working in startups, investors. Sash and I are lucky enough to speak and it's going to be a really good time. Um, but everyone listening should know Nick Crocker. He's one of the OGs of the Australian VC firm, of the Australian VC industry, I should say. He's a three times exited founder. He's previously been the CEO of Startmate, which is one of the great sort of community-based organisations that have spurred on the Australian ecosystem. And he's been a partner at Blackbird since 2016. So you've obviously invested in a lot of companies, sat on board, seen a lot of companies. So it's going to be a lot of material to work with. Yeah, can't wait. Yeah, thanks for coming on. Excited. And Nick, we actually had so much fun pre- preparing for this podcast. I mean, we always have fun preparing for podcasts, but I actually sat through for hours and hours and yeah. read your writing. And I can say you're an absolutely amazing writer. And something we love about you is your intellectual curiosity across different domains. Like you write about love, you write about you know things to do in San Francisco, you write about all kinds of things. And I noticed in one of your re- recent branches um, kind of releases, you had the Fred again boiler room linked. And that's something that me and Adam love. We've talked a lot about yeah. it with our friends. Kind of why did you include that piece in the in branches? I think as you get older, your brain can't find love for new artists. Like it's scientifically proven that you have this moment when you're about 16 where you find all your favorite artists and then for the rest of your life, you just listen to them. Yeah. And so... Fred, again, is one of those rare artists that's come into my life and become one of my favourite artists in my late 30s, which is very, very rare. And so I think he's a musical genius. And the point of Branches, which is the newsletter, is to share things that I think are like timelessly good Mm. that we might look back on in 10 or 20 years and still say that's a really good boiler room set, like the Nicholas Jar boiler room set. It's probably close to 10 years old now. You can go back and pick it up. It's still as good as it ever was. So it's just about finding those timeless things in life and I feel like he is like he's one of those artists that's delivering that right now. So you know, I was we will talk a little bit about the newsletter but sort of why do I write it? I write it for the I write it for myself as in I write the newsletter I would read first. Yeah. If I was a subscriber of it and yeah. so I'm just sharing stuff with myself that I really love basically. And, and what's the process like of like writing that newsletter? Like do you kind of watch something and moves you, read something and moves you and you say, hey, I'm going to include this in branches? Yeah, so it basically just builds up inside me where it would be almost like a frustration, like I have to tell someone about this. So I watched this, it's called, uh, this a comedian slash magician called Derek Delgadio and he did this documentary called In and of Itself. It's not a documentary, it's like a live performance, hard to explain. It absolutely blew my mind. Wow. Like I was just tears rolling down my face at a magician and it's he's a magician remember yeah. so weird experience and so I'm like I have to share this because it's not every day that you come across content uh anything that moves you so deeply so that one's the first one so I'm like that's going in branches and then eventually I'll have in and of itself the Fred again mix an article that I absolutely love I think it, the article I shared in the last edition was the uh, Solomon article mm. in from the New Yorker about yeah. this incredible DJ called Solomon that I love as well and you build up this like I have to tell people about these three or four things and that becomes branches. And then I just trying to find a way to make them all fit into a, like a narrative flow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I'm really interested. Where did this curiosity come from? Do you think it's something that you were literally born with from day one or were there sort of moments, experiences where you were self-aware? Like I'm a really curious person. I like following my interests, like in a really sort of deep rabbit hole like that. No, I don't think I realized that maybe until the last year or two, but as I look back, my dad made fine furniture so he was really what was that? fun. F- he was a wood- oh, okay. he was a woodworker. Okay. Yeah. So he was really passionate about his craft, uh, and the output of the craft was just single pieces of furniture. So it wasn't like he was this mega businessman or anything. He was just passionate about designing and and creating tables and chairs and um, just beautiful pieces of furniture. And I think when you do those um, personality tests, I always show up way like right up the top of on how much I care about aesthetics. Wow. Some of, and so it's never, I've, they've always, it's always hit me on the personality test. Oh, you really care about this. But until I've got older, I haven't realized I actually do care about it more than mm. most people. I think there are just people for whom that doesn't, that stuff doesn't resonate, resonate. Great music, great furniture, timeless art. You know, I, I, I went to Canberra on the weekend. Actually, in the last edition of Branches, I wrote about this too. But 
There's a, there's an art, there's a there's an artwork called Riverbend, which yeah. is a Sydney Nolan, you know, legendary Australian artist that he painted for his dad, and he painted it to prove that art was not a waste of time. Mm. So he spent years doing this extraordinary piece. Um, it's a it's a painting of a riverbend that he and his dad would spend time at together, and then a month before it was finished, his dad died and never got to see it. And I just sat in front of Riverbend for on Sunday for like half an hour, just oh. completely overwhelmed with the emotion of it. That's the stuff when you get to this time of life where you're like, most people wouldn't sit for half an hour in front of an artwork. Um, and, you know, 10 years ago, I probably would have been embarrassed to, to say that. But now I'm just like, that's who I am. Yeah. I can't, got to acknowledge that those feelings are there. So, Do, do you feel like you feel kind of highs and lows more than other people? And, and, and the yeah. context of this is, is that a lot of people who have this creative appreciation for art, like I have friends like that, they start crying in documentaries and movies and all that kind of stuff. It seems like the highs are, are really amazing, but the lows are also extra painful. Yeah, I have to. I, I, that's exactly what it is. So I have to work extra hard relative compared to a normal person. Or I shouldn't use the word normal. Compared to the average person, I have to work way harder on my mental health to keep keep that the bottom end of my emotions sort of, and yeah. then the and then the top end of my emotions like I just get, I just get to enjoy them. Yeah. But yeah, the flip side is I have to do a lot of work to stay even keeled, and I think that surprises people. Um, because they see me as as an even keeled person i think what they don't see is the work that goes in into that but yeah mm. it's, a, it's a it's a good insight we'd love to kind of dive into that work a little bit later but something i thought would be a kind of another fun way to introduce this episode before we dive into your wonderful career is we kind of like to understand who someone is at their core and i think we've got a little bit of a sense so far but what would your wife say your top three most admirable qualities are oh, good question she would say i think she Get emotional talking about <laughs> this. She would, she would, she would say I'm a good dad to yeah. our boys. Um, she would say I'm being like a, like a. Oh, I will get emotional talking. About <laughs> She'd say I'm a good dad to her boys, an incredible support to her, and just someone that like really profoundly, deeply cares about the people around them. Particularly, I think, I think family um, is probably how she, she would see me. It's interesting you ask that. A, an exercise that anyone who's listening to this can do that's really powerful it's called the reflected best self yeah i don't know if you've heard of it but basically you write to 10 to 15 of your friends and family people who know you well and you say can you give me three examples where you've seen me at your best mm-hmm. and so what you end up is 50 examples of you at your best yes, and it can really right. change your self-perception because a lot of time we'll spend a lot of people spend their time self-reflecting about what's bad about them fix my weaknesses i'm so bad at this we spend most of our time in that space it's actually powerful to spend some time in the like what am i great at where is my zone of genius and so i did that as part of an executive coaching program that i do and it was eye-opening to see Mm. here's where i think my strengths are but here's where all the people closest to me in the world see them and they're not the same so you can just literally do it with a Google form. When have you give me one or two examples of when you've seen me at my best and send it to people who know you well and then yeah. it's powerful to see what comes back. What did you miss about yourself? Like something that you didn't realize was a strength or maybe you didn't realize it was as much of a strength. I work really matters to me and a lot of my identity is tied up in work and it no one mentioned work. No one mentioned, "Oh, I really admire what you do at Blackbird." It really? was all about other things. And it was all what people admired about, about me in, in that exercise was just all very personal. And I spend more of my time at work thinking about work than I do anything else. And so it shocked me how little that came up yeah. as something that mattered to the people around me. Yeah, that's so fascinating. I think that sort of goes along with the line of, I think Steve Jobs is in that paragraph. He's saying like at the end of his life, like what do you really reflect about and care about? It wasn't actually working that extra day. It was that extra day of family and friends. I think we can get so embedded in our own identity and things we think are important, but from everyone else's perception, it's actually really different. I I think a lot of ambitious people have a mismatch between what they think is important and what other people like derive importance from Yeah, with with their, with their company. Mm. I'm the exact same with my relationships. Like, I'm so caught up in this world. And I talk about it a lot, and that's not what my family and friends really care about, right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> shockingly, <laughs> they care a shockingly low amount. Yeah, yeah. Which is which is a good thing, right? Like if if someone just judged you on how good you were at work all the yeah. time and stuff, that wouldn't be a good way to live life. Yeah, I, I like I liked it as an exercise. It depressurized slightly, but 
you know, in a sense, like I could fail at what I did and I still had work. I, f- I could fail professionally, but I still had worth. Yeah. Um, anyway, a rec- uh, definitely an exercise you both should do and anyone yeah. listening should yeah. do. No, yeah. that's fascinating. I'm definitely going to do that after this. And um, we'd love to start diving into a bit of your early career. And I guess like hearing all this stuff, what fascinates me is that I would have picked that you would be like an artist or um, a DJ or a music teacher after hearing about like sort of your emotions and your creativity. But you actually studied law and then you ended up becoming a journalist. I sort of, I sort of get the journalist angle, don't really get the law. I was just wondering <laughs> if you could explain the story about what was sort of the framework for those decisions. So up. not great at maths, not great at science. But super ambitious, school captain, did well at school. What does that yeah. personality <laughs> type do? They do law because it's like this, it's status seeking. Like what's the highest status thing I could do next? So that was literally the extent of it. And then I had the virtue signaling part of me that went, I want to do human rights law. <laughs> so, like I did, law yeah. so I did <laughs> yeah. political science with a Spanish minor and a peace and conflict studies minor and, you know, just realized I didn't, didn't, I wasn't vibing with that at all. So, so law is just, you know, being a 17-year-old status-seeking person that doesn't understand the world. And a lot of us have parents for whom, like, the highest thing you can do is to be a doctor, to be a lawyer, to be one of these, um, I don't know how else to describe them, but high-status professions. Like, if you go to a barbecue and you line up, like, a doctor and a taxi driver and a, you know, whatever, people assign status to these jobs or historically have. So I was just caught in that trap. You don't want to come to an Indian family um, barbecue. It'd be, it, it, it's, it's that much worse. Wait, uh, but isn't that changing now? Where all the great CEOs globally oh, right yeah. now? <laughs> yeah, a lot of them are going to tech. Tech's becoming the status right. symbol, but it, it, it's just shifting. There's been some really, really funny memes on Twitter about like people becoming CEOs or startup founders that just raise cash, and then their grandma texts them, why are you still not a doctor anymore? <laughs> Yeah, that's hilarious. And, and so you never actually practiced as a lawyer, as Adam mentioned. And you speak about in Branch just this moment when you were 23 and you went to your first startup meetup and you had this kind of this kind of realization that this is where you wanted to be. Before we dive into that realization, I want to ask, what were you like at 23? Because we're both 23 now. It's cool to compare really successful, amazing people to what we're like now. Good question. So I would have been... I just bought my first apartment because I felt like I had a story, a family story where my dad um, got offered the, the, the chance to buy an apartment, mm. uh, to buy an apartment, to buy an island off the coast of New Zealand. Wow. And his uncle, who owned a piggery, <laughs> said, I'll loan you the money. Okay. And he said, no. Nah. And I always thought to myself, damn, dude, you we could have owned an <laughs> island. <laughs> so my version of bu- buying an island was... Um, getting a mortgage when I was 23 and buying an apartment in Brisbane which <laughs> didn't work out quite the same as an island would have so I had to get a job so I got the mortgage before I got the job and then I had to get a job so I actually worked in government in the department of tourism fair trading wine industry development and women mm. and the women didn't wasn't included in the acronym which says something about yeah. the Queensland government in the early 2000s and so I had a full-time job doing that I was miserable doing it Mm. and so i was like how can i go and find people who are inspirational and how can i get them to talk to me as a kid working in the government Mm. who's doing badly at law and didn't go to private school doesn't have any network and i thought everyone talks to journalists Mm. like it sort of doesn't matter who you are if you're like hey it's nick from the sunday mail everyone's saying yes so i basically just pitched the editor of the sunday mail every day for like three months to let me have a column (laughs) profiling what did that look like was that like (laughs) constant barrage of text messages no i was calling his um his ea okay she would just be like yeah i passed on the message he he's got the message (laughs) and then just like i don't know three months in she said oh actually he's interested yeah and uh that was a breakthrough because then i could meet anyone Mm. so i went and met politicians and i met like world famous puppeteers and a jeweler (laughs) and athletes. And I was just in my head, I was doing an interview for the paper, but really what was going on, I was like, could I be this person one day? Because I haven't found the model of the kind of person I think I am or I want to be. This is exactly our podcast in university. (laughs) (laughs) All right, we need more puppeteers and more jewelers (laughs) just to make sure that's not not your vibe. (laughs) And then I went and met three entrepreneurs worked out of an electricity substation and just overlooking the Suncorp Stadium and I was there three minutes and we 
one of them said, let's run a half marathon together. And I just remember we like climbed up this ladder onto the rooftop overlooking Brisbane. And I remember thinking like, these guys can wake up every day. They're in their early 20s, they do exactly what they want. They're completely self-defined. I didn't know you could do this. I didn't know that was a path. Like my dad made furniture. My mum was a GP in a country town. Like I didn't even have an entrepreneur archetype in my mind. I didn't even real. I didn't even think actually, oh, there's people who create jobs, not just people who have jobs. Yeah. And then I met three of them and then it just accelerated really fast from there. And mm. here we are. What spoke to you about that moment? Was it a sense of autonomy? Was it a sense of boundless sort of no limitations? I think like growing up, I always had to pretend like I wasn't ambitious. This is something that's f- sometimes foreign if you went up and I think this is both of you maybe, but if you went to private schools with ambitious people, it's it's normal. I didn't have that experience. I always had to pretend like I wasn't ambitious, like I wasn't smart, like I didn't want things to happen for me. I had to kind of just hide. And with these, when I met those guys, I realized I don't have to, I can, I could give them my biggest ambition here and they would not care. They'd say, okay, cool. How, how are you going to do it? How can we help you? And that was why I moved to New York when I was 25. And that was a big part of New York was just being surrounded by people that would, there was just no version of ambition that could scare people. And where I, where, where I, you know, the way I grew up, my kind of upbringing, not my parents, but the people I was surrounded by, I think there's a lot of ways that your ambition could scare people and they would just be like, Mm. What are, you're full of yourself you're a loser and i just i just loved being around people that were just larger than me in their ambitions it's almost like a sense of calm came over me mm. yeah the jolly swagman podcast i, I don't know if you love it. it yeah yeah great podcast he made a tweet storm about some of the places he visited in america and he said every australian should go to new york just to heighten the sense and expand the sense of your ambition and i haven't been to new york but i think that's what you sort of felt like like it's a yeah. sense that you can do anything yeah yeah and, and that's accepted there yeah, it's beautiful, um, but I think, you know, there's good and bad aspects of that freedom as well, which, you know, I'm sure anyone that goes to New York now can see. Um, and so, Nick, after this, you kind of decided to be an entrepreneur or tried to, started to try your own things. And the first of that was Sessions? No, the Sessions came really late. So so th- those three guys became like fast friends just instantly. I was just like, how can I be around them all yeah. the time? And they were just like, what are you doing working in government? Like... You're a loser. Stop <laughs> stop that. Yeah. You know, that's the other thing about being around people like that was they were just really direct and they yeah. weren't, oh, let's be polite. You're, you're doing great. They're like, stop it. Yeah. Like, go do something <laughs> else. And so within about a month, I took a job as the CEO. And this the CEO is a grand title. So I should just call it first employee and only employee of a startup that was helping independent artists get their music onto iTunes. So they pushed me right into that. And then a year into that, I built a bit of a profile in the music industry. And I had job offers from um, a bunch of the major labels and a bunch of big artist managers who said, come come and work for us. And I thought, well, I don't want to work for any of these individ- people individually, but I'll start an, an agency and consult. And that was – I left to do that. So I ended up in music. I did, I did go to music, which is where you said you thought I would end up going. <laughs> but I just wasn't – what it came down to was when you're working with founders and you're an investor, your incentives mostly align. It's really easy to have conversations because you both basically want the same thing. I could never find that incentive alignment with artists because mm. artists are driven by something much less easy to articulate and mm. I just couldn't tap into that. And I look at great artist managers now and they find this balance of empathy and love for the artists that I just could never do with musicians but I can with founders. Mm, that's really interesting. There's no ARR metrics for for artists. One of the best managers in, ever in Australian history. Um, I think I'm sure he won't m- mind me naming him. His name's John Watson. He managed Silverchair, among many others. He said the difficulty with artists is often they're trying to write a song to impress their friends, and as an artist manager, you're trying to write find the song they write that will connect with the most people. Yeah. And if you're run, trying to write a song that connects for your friends that's a very different song than the one that hundreds of thousands of people scream back to you in an arena his trick was always to say to artists which song are you most embarrassed by and which song did you kind of put in the scrap heap because you thought it was too cheesy (laughs) and that was often the song that was the one that you could shape into something that the artist felt proud about but was the one that was going to connect 
Wow. Wow. Yeah, as a young person sort of running that company, that agency, what were some key learnings that you took away with you that might have stuck with you from that that you started to apply to other companies that you built? So it was a really small company, right? It was, yeah. um, I think their marketing budget they gave me for the year was like $250 or something, $250, $250. And I remember thinking, well, I called up the poster place. I was like, how many posters could I get with $250? He's like 10. And I was like, how many artists will I convert with 10 posters around <laughs> Brisbane? So what I ended up doing was hiring a little mini armada of interns and then we would just sit on MySpace. I'm really concerned about how much you paid these <laughs> interns. <laughs> oh, this was, this was not paid work, I'm sure. <laughs> I, I'm sure statute of limitations is, is... I don't even know how that has worked, by the way. I am a lawyer, but well, I did study law. Anyway, it's, it's long enough in the past and I actually still know some. I'm still in touch with some of them. So we used to just sit on MySpace starting conversations with artists and asking them how they were selling their music online. And then as, as part of the conversation, they'll be like, well, how do I get on iTunes? And we would say, well, we can help. Mm. So we would just be sending thousands. And so it was that, it, it was that, how can you be really scrappy and resourceful when there's no resources and yet kind of connect and, and, and just not be a spammer, like actually try and help these people. And so the reason I got all the job offers from record labels is because I'd written a guide about how to market your music online. And artists were struggling with it, but unbeknownst to me, the labels were really struggling with it. And so when they saw, it was this amazing experience. Sometimes in life you'll, ship something that connects with thousands of people at once it's a it's an incredible rush mm. one of the first times i did that was this I, I put that that pdf of how to market yourself online for download for free on our website and we we're just watching this excel spreadsheet just fill out with emails it was just like 10 people from emi and 10 people from universal all in a day like it was clearly mm. it was connecting with people and everyone was sharing it with the people and that was that single document was the thing that kind of kick-started my music kind of tech career because I was able to start a company from that. Wow. And then – and Sessions came a little bit after that. So then I do um, – then we did We Are Hunted, which was a music website, yeah. which was a spin-out from the agency. And then I moved to Boxy mm. in New York and I worked for one of my sort of internet heroes, a guy called Zach Klein who founded College Humor and then co-founded Vimeo um, and – was someone who I just admired online. And so I just Facebook messaged him and said, can I come work for you for free? Just have me for a month because I just want to learn mm. from you. Yeah. How are you funding yourself in New York? Was this based on your savings? We sold the music website. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I was just living off the off the sales from, from that. And that's a whole other story. Um, but yeah, I um, in my mind, I was like four weeks in New York with one of the people I most admire on the internet. Yeah. Nothing can go wrong. Mm. And then anyway, two weeks in, they offered me a full-time job and I stayed. Wow. And then I, after that, I left. I was like, I want to do a startup. And then we did sessions. Mm. And were you always kind of bold growing up? Because it seems like these are very bold steps for someone to make that, you know, worked in the government a couple of years ago, didn't really know what they want to do. Was this like, was there a kind of a risk-taking nature in you growing up? No, where, so you know I said those personality tests so yeah. I show up high, high on aesthetics I also show up high on like um, exaggerated self-belief mm. <laughs> like unjustified yeah. in some ways so I always had some sense of entitlement to be two to five levels above where I deserve to be even that government job I applied to I applied through the grad program of the government job didn't get an interview mm. but then I saw a, like a job two levels above it and I was like, well, it doesn't sound that hard. So I applied for it, didn't get it, but they gave me a job. So it's level three is grad, level four, next level, level five. I didn't get this, but they had another job at level four overseeing the grad program. <laughs> <laughs> so I'd gone from not being able to get an interview to the grad program to overseeing the grad program <laughs> just by mentally being like, well, I could probably do. Uh, yeah, I, I didn't get in. So I think I think that comes from um, most, like my mom had always just, I don't, it wasn't ever verbally, but I always just get, got the sense from her that um, it was just like it was okay to feel entitled to good things happening to you. Mm. And it's good, good and bad, but I always just had a sense that I was like, I ch you know, I was school captain because I chased wanting to be school captain and I chased wanting to be perceived as, as excellent. Mm. So mostly a beneficial thing. Actually, when you get, become an adult, you have to completely let go of that. Like, yeah. The chase for prizes that are worthless, basically. 
Um, but yeah, it's that combination of entitlement and self belief that was just critical, actually, to sometimes just you know, like Zach, to reach out to Zach and to us to have the belief that I could be valuable to him. I I look back on that now and I go, yeah, that was pretty gutsy, mm. you know. Or even at, before I left, so Jules and I had been together seven years at that point. I was, wow. guess I was, yeah, 24, 25. I just was like, well, you know, I, I'm going to move to New York. You're going to keep studying here. So obviously we're going to be long distance for a while. So, But I, you know, we, we got married, we got engaged before. I look back now, I look at, you know, you guys are 23, so imagine next year you get engaged like <laughs> it's, yeah. it's it's early yeah. relative yeah. to most of your peers i assume so you know just just that, that i don't know it was just like a confidence in my own instincts i guess mm, mm. so it sounds like there was a lot of scrappy beginnings in the first sort of couple startups that you did and you yes. fast forward a bit and you'd exited three startups and i'm wondering by the time you'd done your third how are you a different person through all the sort of learnings the triumphs and the tribulations that you went through i mean none of them were successful really on any meaningful scale so what did i learned three startups when in. you say they're not successful do you mean by well, they don't exist they, they don't exist today yeah. so they disappeared so i tried something and then you know i talked with the start about building something that's timeless well it's timeless which is last centuries but then before that there's something that can last more than a decade mm. and none of what i built lasted more than about three years mm. so that's really that it's not like i learned a lot but that that's what success is is building something enduring mm. and then something that you can pass on to someone else and that they can be a kind of a steward and a custodian of three startups in i didn't know anything honestly like i still look back at, at 20 that would have been sort of 2016 because remember after sessions sold to my fitness pal i was at my fitness pal for two years and then under armor for three is that right no, Under Armour for – my fitness pal for a year, Under Armour for two years. So I had three years as an operator at my fitness pal in Under Armour. And I still look back at where I was at 2016 just like I didn't know anything. But versus feeling uncomfortable with that, I actually think looking back on your past self with a sense of embarrassment is a sign that you grew really fast. Yeah. Because if you're comfortable with how you looked five years ago, then – do you look the same as you do now? And in which case, is that really what you want? Have you really put yourself in that discomfort zone? Speaking of seek <laughs> discomfort, speaking of your T-shirt, um, have you put in yourself in the discomfort zone to enable that learning? So, yeah, I didn't know anything. And I think, you know, in a sense, I don't know anything today. Mm-hmm. Wow. That's yeah, um, yeah oh, I was just going to say, it's funny how you say you don't feel like it's a success because I think there's always different levels of success. Success for what one person might be starting companies. For another, it might be exiting. For you, it was about creating enduring value. When you like really look back at your past with sober eyes, how do you actually feel about what you started? Are you sort of proud of those accomplishments or is there this sense that I, I really wish I'd tried harder, I wish I did things differently, I wish I'd been able to build something that sort of outlasted me? Good. Oof, never thought about that. Blackbird's easily the most successful thing I've ever been a part of. So that feels cool. Because I can tell you what not feeling successful looks like. So I'm like quite a good judge of what actual success looks like. And I actually love that I didn't have to found Blackbird and kind of get it through the first four years. I don't think I was the right person to do that. But I also know the impact that I've had at Blackbird in the last six years. So I guess I feel like everything was just leading up to that. And you know, I look at athletes and often the best coaches are sort of failed players. Craig Bellamy, Alistair Clarkson, they're not failed players, but they were players that didn't reach, they're not the greats of the game. Lee Matthews being the only example of a great player, great coach. But often you you build a passion or an empathy. Like I reckon the best artist managers are kind of failed musicians because you, 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 you love so much and have so much empathy for what it is to be a founder or an artist or an athlete that it's a, it's a, it's a fulfilling career to dedicate yourself to helping those people. But you don't feel any sense of sadness that you're not one of them. Like I don't, I don't want to be a founder ever again. I'm so happy not to be founding things. I'm so happy to be supporting founders. But at the same time, I just have so much admiration for the founders I get to work with. Like I, I sort of can't believe they get up every day and take on the, the struggles that they take on. And like that's the right mindset to succeed in this job is to have that admiration to, to have that mindset of, um, yeah, admiration. 
Yeah, and I guess you have that empathy as well. And we're, I think we're going to jump to Blackbird in a second. But before we move on, during that time when you were living in America, you're founding all these startups, and obviously you're having a long distance relationship. How did you navigate all those things and family and all those kinds of conditions in your mind? And you know, what has that taught you about love and relationships? Yeah, the only hard thing was was just being away from Jules for what ended up being four years. So we got engaged in. And then four years later, we got married. We got our 10-year wedding anniversary this year. Congratulations. So tw- and 20 years together, which is crazy to say because I'm 39. So more than half my life is yeah. – <laughs> like the majority of my life is now being with Jules. So that was really hard and that was – like I don't want to say it was skill. The luck part of it was that I just have a wife that I just love so much that it was never a question in my mind that mm. it was, wasn't worth the sacrifice of going through long distance. And then I was lucky that she's just – so forgiving and was willing to support me to do that mm. so i don't want to say this what was the skill part the skill part was just sticking with it when it was hard and being yeah. willing to go have an awkward conversation via skype because there's no zoom back then mm. and just sit with it and have a few bad weeks where the communication cycles aren't there but you know when you meet the person that you're going to spend the rest of your life with and build a family with and they're basically at 18 Mm. 19 i was that's more luck than skill yeah like and then and then that you can grow become adults together and survive all that build careers independently of one another but still survive all that yeah i mean that is there's yeah there's a bit of skill in it but my my god like i just i i really wish on other people that that stroke of luck where someone can come into your life at 19 years old and you can almost know instantly that that's the person you're going to be with for the rest of your life. Mm. And then for that to play out probably better than I ever even hoped. And you get to have kids who reflect back to you, just who make you grateful every day that like your partner, like half of them is her. Mm. Like that's a, that's a stunning stroke of luck. Like kind of, you can't ask for more in life than that. Mm. Wow. That's very profound um, listening to that. And I think there's so many elements of luck in investing in startups, but that's probably the luckiest one you've got. My God, yeah. Um, and, like, remember that my dad died at, when I was 19 and then Jules comes into my life at 19. That The timing of that, insane. that, I become an adult and lose my father but find this person that's kind of the most sort of defining relationship of my adult life happens all at once. I mm. mean, yeah, what are yeah, the chances? Just we want to get onto Blackbird, but you said defining there. How do you think she defined you all those years of you starting companies, being in New York? How did that change you, your relationship with her? I just always felt confident going out into the world. Mm. Sort of like no matter what anyone says about me or, you know, like I've had to develop an inner scorecard, still doing it. You know, I, I told you before I was someone that looked for like external validation that I was, I was you know, worthy I just shortcut the worthiness piece by having her as my backup. Like, my God, if she thinks I'm all right, I'm probably all right. (laughs) And, and so that, you know, and then it's just hard for me to think that like my identity is so tied up with, with Mm. her as the other half of my kind of total, total being. And, and yeah, just that's the, that's been the foundation of, of everything. Yeah. I can definitely relate in the sense it gives you this warm blanket of sort of emotional security and when you get that, I guess, that sense of worthiness of validation from someone else, you just go out into the world. You don't have those sort of sense of angst. And well, it certainly makes them easier because yeah. you're kind of like, okay, that didn't work, but like I can go back and talk to Jules about it. Yeah, for sure. I guess changing to a slightly different note now, um, we want to talk about Blackbird, what is you said is sort of the greatest thing that you've ever been a part of. And before we go into what they are and how they invest, could you just paint a bit of a picture of, 2016 you joined blackbird i guess what was happening in your life at that time um like how did those conversations with blackbird initially begin and maybe a bit of the context of the australian tech ecosystem back then as well yeah so actually go back to 2011 yeah and when i had my agency it's called native digital um i wanted to do y combinator for australia i thought this would be a sick idea so i went and asked a bunch of people and i said i want to do y combinator for australia and they said, no, terrible idea. But you should meet this guy, Nicky, because he's got the same idea. And I met Nicky and I was like, oh, you're going to do this idea way better than I will. 
and we met for coffee in Darlinghurst, right near where, near, near to where we are right now. And we just talked about um, which cafe is it around. Oh, I will we'll put it in the liner notes because okay. it's like a classic cafe that Nick used to take all his Still meetings around. at. I have to go there for a coffee and recreate that moment. <laughs> yeah, we we met through Twitter DMs. I was like, hey, I, ho- I hear you're doing something, and th- that was uh, yeah, that was early like 2010, 2011. And so I just became a Startmate mentor at the first Startmate demo day. I had three thousand dollars of Commonwealth Bank shares, and I sold them so I could invest. That plus two thousand dollars of cash that I'd saved into that first Startmate cohort. So I was really like, just very natural. This is an awesome idea, and and just when you met Nikki, you just knew. He just thought about it so much more deeply, and he had that network already embedded that was going to make it successful, which just instantly you could see. So Nick and I build a relationship through Startmate. And I moved to San Francisco and started a company. And then um, I was the third founder they ever funded. So I went, I think it went Canva, Ed Rollo. You've had Duncan on the podcast. Everyone knows Canva. You can listen to the Ed Rollo episode and then, and then me. So the first ever Blackbird Investor Day was the three of us presenting. Wow. Um, what a cohort. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. Mm. And I still remember going down um, with Mel and Cliff in the lift. And they hadn't released their product yet. And I think I had 25 grand of like annual revenue. I was sort of like, well... Yeah, I'm probably the furthest along here. Anyway, <laughs> we, we know how that ended up. So uh, so I built my relationship with Nikki and Rick from that point when Blackbird was a small unknown fund and the two of them were two unknown fund managers. Mm. So did the startup, sold the startup, which was the first time money had ever been returned to Blackbird, which was you know, very small. They invested 150 grand, you know. I, I was, we did it, we, we did it wire transfer last week of 30 million dollars to a portfolio company i remember i just thought we just what we just transferred in one hit more than our entire first fund mm. and i remember raising 150 grand from nikki and rick and just being like oh my god that is so much money like i i better not lose this so i even though it was tiny minuscule you know it actually mattered a lot to me to, to return that money because it was 97 individuals who'd kind of backed startups i that was one of the things that weighed so heavily on the founding journey. I was like, I cannot lose the money of these 97 people who I respect so much and, and Nikki and Rick. I was like, I can't make them go back to the LPs and say, oh, we, we backed the wrong horse here. So I got to know them through really tough times with a startup. I remember having to take Nikki out for dinner for pizza one night and explain to him that I thought the startup was going to fail. And I just loved the way they both treated me through that process. So I sold the company and then I was in San Francisco so we'd catch up every time they'd come over and every founder. I would say from that first fund, Blackbird's first fund, half of them were my personal friends. Wow. Just, you know, Michael, deals Michael, Fox and I, Michael Fox was president of the UQ Law School when my first year of law. We, that was, wow. that was where, how we first met. Now he's done yeah. uh, Shoes of Prey and Fable. And Ned Dwyer, he and I did Native Digital together. He's, yeah. he, he had a business that he sold to GoDaddy out of that first fund and then you get to know everyone. So it was a very small group of people that i felt deeply embedded in they they did vc the way i sort of you kind of would hope vc would be done by good people and then i just realized once we had our first um oscar once we had our, our son first fight son we're like we got to come home and then i was just like i got to work at blackbird i got to find a way to be indispensable to these guys and um i convinced them to let me call myself a venture partner um uh, doesn't care about titles so he's like sure weird but <laughs> whatever <laughs> i was just like just get the blackbird logo on the linkedin and then i was just like do you mind if i start coming to partner meetings It'd just be great to learn <laughs> imagine imagine just some ra- that random <laughs> trying to that. do that now That's <laughs> <straight>. <laughs> <laughs> and again they're like yeah sure i mean it's sort of helpful to have you there and you know product and so you can bring a different perspective and then i was helping the startmate founders and, and i was a top ranked mentor in the, one of the cohorts and nikki had been the top ranked mentor up to that point and so he was like oh guy actually is useful mm. and then i think at that point nikki was just needed to hand start mate off to someone else because the fund was getting so big and so i was like well i'm here <laughs> let me have it so yeah i was getting up very early in the morning to run start mate and then um we eventually came home and i just i don't know it happened by osmosis more than like a job description and then i apply it was just very very natural and yeah like I was attending part. I, they gave me the they gave me a board seat before I joined the company. They're like, mm. "Hey, this company's in music. You take it." Yeah. 
And I'm just so trusting. So, wow. yeah, none of that's possible anymore. It's only possible when the ecosystem is like 15 people and you know <laughs> all of them. But I was, I'm so glad I'm not applying for jobs today. I would not have any hope against the cohorts of people coming into venture right now. Yeah, um, there's a lot of time moving in the space and it feels like Startmate's a pipeline for some great investors because James Tynan was also CEO of um, Startmate now he's at Square Peg and since there's a lot of amazing people that mm. come from that. Echo as well. Yeah. 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 Um, so Blackbird today, obviously you've just raised a billion dollar fund um, which has been announced. What, what What's kind of um, the areas you're most excited about investing in right now? Yeah, I mean, I've, I've never been excited about investing in areas. I've just been excited about investing in f- founders. And you just never know when you're going to meet a founder where you just, it's such a it's such a weird job because you kind of, you do 100 meetings and 98 times. And that's like statistically, that's true for me. 98 times will be a pass. Mm. But twice or once in every 50 meetings, you never know which of the 50, you get this like rush of emotion mm. like i can feel it in my body i'm like oh i'm about to invest in this <laughs> like i actually feel it like four minutes in i'm going I, i'm pretty much sure i'm going to do it but yeah. that's again 98 percent of the time it's not what it feels like and then that two percent you just have to calm yourself down well, in what's, the meeting. That, what, what's that four minutes like if someone wants to get investment mm. from nick crocker what do they have to do in the first four minutes i mean go you know go be tim doyle or ross chaldecott or benjamin humphrey or you know, yeah. go and be, go and build a build a career and become a person that is just undeniable. Yeah, you know what it's like. You've been in the room with these people. You mm. just you feel it. Yeah, it just just wow mm. straight away. So there's an, and they're all such different. Those three people I just mentioned are so different. Mm. Like they're nothing alike, but they all have this. You have a sense you're in the room with someone special. Yeah. So yeah, it's it's a weird job where you're just waiting for this. Uh, everyone's thinking they're optimizing for the science of MRR and ARR and churn and actually it's just optimized for the art of how you make someone feel in the first 60 seconds. And and can you get that same feeling virtually? Yeah. Okay. Ross from kind or virtual. Yeah. Wow. Wow. And what gives you sort of conviction that this style of investing is the best? Because some investors famously, they are thematic. They'll look at sort of areas of the world and say I want to invest here they'll even say like Bill Gurley he was like I think taxis is going to be some sort of disruption and he met with four sort of taxi uber style companies um but you're like sort of founder first really wow me in that first meeting um what makes you think that is the best way or that is your way well I can tell you it's my way I can't tell you if it's good or not (laughs) I mean the scorecard's okay so far I think I'm also grateful to have um partners in Samantha and Rick and Nikki and the and Tom and Tolo and Phoebe and the rest of the team who are not like me. And we have a pretty aggressive pursuit of truth in those IC meetings. And a pretty we all feel a sense of embarrassment or shame, I think, if if anyone is point scoring or doing anything except trying to get to the truth. Mm-hmm. So I would say I've embraced my strength, which is that founder driven investing style, but I will temper that by seeking the input of Nikki, Rick, Samantha, and they're looking at the same thing as me and not always feeling the same. What else can I learn about from that? So being part of a team is critical. And then I just couldn't do the, I couldn't invest any other way. So it's just embracing like, this is the way I'm going to invest and I'll succeed or fail investing like that. And I've been really fortunate to have had a couple of companies really break out and success in venture is really just one one good company a decade mm. and i feel pretty confident i've cleared that bar in mm. half you know half because i've been a partner since 2018 since my fourth year as a partner you know pro- progression is good but we'll see mm. so i guess narrowing that down i guess what you have and the way you like to do investing is it's about assessing talent assessing founders yeah. what do you think makes you a great assessor of talent and founders what gives you alpha over other venture investors yeah i mean i have i would i would not say i have alpha over other investors i genuinely am a work in progress but to the extent that i'm a good judge of people i have thought about that and first of all being a good judge of people means that i might get it right 25 percent of the time and not 20 percent of the time it's not i'm not sitting here saying i'm 100 percent right all the time but i'm i think on average i am almost 40 now and there's just been enough times where i've had a judgment about someone and i've had enough time in life to see how that played out Mm. where i like actually have really good instincts on this so it comes from growing up in a country town 
having to get two buses to go to school and the first like the first bus does a drop off at a school that hates anyone who goes to the next school so i have to figure out my way through don't get beaten up on the first leg of the ride and then you're good on the second leg of the ride like all and so you have to like learn the bus you have to learn each of the individual personalities and what makes them tick and then I lived in France for a year when I finished school. Lived in Mexico for six months, part of my arts degree. Lived in New York. I lived in San Francisco. I just think um, I have a natural tune in to people. Mm. Uh, I have a massive natural curiosity in people, which comes, which I got from my mum. Um, like she's a, she's a GP, but I think what drives her is the curiosity of people's stories and being a part of that, which is identical. I'm mm. curious about people and I want to be a part of their story, but I just express it not through medicine but through venture and so i just think the net the net um of having met so people from so many walks of life in so many different contexts and having being judgmental about them i mean that can be in, taken as a negative but genuinely i'm always in my head like mm. trying to size someone up just like i was first day of high school trying to size up this bus who is this person and what makes them tick and i just don't think most people think about other people like that mm. most people don't think about other people as much as i do mm. so um yeah i don't I'd, i would stop short of saying it gives me alpha but to the extent that's why i invest that's where i get my confidence from mm. um in, in just having seen people evolve over time yeah that's um it, it seems like you do have a very intuitive sense of people and i think there's something to speak to there in terms of all those life experiences giving you kind of this way of you know quote unquote judging people right and it begs the question do you think that someone can be a good venture investor when they're young and they haven't had these life experiences and this compounding of you know pattern recognition yeah for sure Mm. because venture is one good investment a decade yeah so there's no reason why that amazing first investment you can't make when you're 21 Mm. um or you know there's a um you you could have spotted jack from airwallx really early on tried to help him out, become like a really trusted confidant of his, yeah. told everyone about him. Like there are, the great founders have a period where they're not, they're not great founders yet yeah. and they're available to be helped and supported and you could do that at 21, you could do it at 51, yeah. um, but you need, we talked about luck, you know, you need it to be there, you need it to be an Airwallex scale um, success or, you know, the relationship Rick built, built with um, Mel and Cliff, like that, that was the first investment that Blackbird ever made. Like there yeah. was no reason we had to warm up to Canva. Like it, well, that wasn't our hundredth investment. That was our first. So that was yeah. your first investment. Yeah. Wow. It wasn't mine, but <laughs> Nikki and Rick's first investment <laughs> yeah. was Canva. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Venture is interesting and polarizing because on the one hand, there's so many aspects of a skill set you can build out. You can come, become a really good judge of talent. You can get all the different steps of the DD process. You can learn it really well. Then, as you said, you can be a 21-year-old, you can form the right relationship with a future $10 billion company and you're off to the races. How it's about luck. That's yeah. it. And that'll make up for every bad decision. You, you can do 99 bad decisions, mm. but the, you made one good one and that's all that matters. How, how do you reflect on that as a VC, though? Like, Because how are you meant to be self-aware and judge your own investing track record if there is this huge component of luck? So I track how much money have I invested in founders and what is the current value of that money today? Yeah. We don't track that at Blackbird. Interestingly, at an individual level, we obviously track it as a team level, but I think there's risks to, to holding people too tightly because you don't want to optimize for mm. price today. But I th- that's one thing. Objectively, I think I need to be measured on my yeah. progress in that sense. But then mostly you don't know. Yeah. Mostly you're yeah. just waiting. And you know, we've, got, we've got portfolio companies whose breakout year was year six and year seven and they didn't get any of those valuation markups for six years and we put money in three or four or five times and didn't see any real return from it. So you, you just wait. You just don't know. It's very. That's why you have to develop the inner scorecard, some sense of comfort that your process holds up. And you know, my offset to that is I always just was tracking my deal flow really, really closely, looking at conversion, looking at I would score deal flow quality. So I want to be seeing a hundred companies, but I want them to be. I don't want to just take a hundred meetings. I want to take a hundred meetings of a certain quality where I'm excited about taking the meeting. So I sort of had to create my own measures of progress along the way. But until the cash comes back, you don't know. Mm. Yeah. And I just want to reflect a second on where the Australian startup ecosystem is now. So you came back and kind of it was in the midst of growing, but a lot of people would say now that it's amazing, right? Sunrise is sold out. There's 
lots of amazing things happening in the ecosystem. There's people like me and Adam who originally wanted to move to the Valley and decided not to because of all the things that are happening in Australia. How do you reflect on where the Australian ecosystem is today and where do you think you'll get to in the next five, 10 years? I mean, first of all, I can't believe it. Yeah. So when I came back in 2016, as recently as 2016, 2017, it was still just completely, mostly ignored by most people. And then the last five years has just been just an explosion of funding, founders, and then community. Yeah. So I reckon about 2009, 2010 was the mo- turning point where people with university medals in physics and maths decide, actually, I'm going to go be a founder. I'm not going to pursue an academic career or a career at a big company. So there's been a cultural shift as well where lots of our most brilliant minds are going, I can go do something and, and start it myself. So I, I am in a bit of a... Uh, I'm shocked at how well it's gone. I think it's probably going better than most people realize too yep. because the super, this superannuation as a, as a pool of capital I think is the fifth largest pool of sovereign wealth. So we've got a 25 million person com- country with the fifth largest pool of sovereign wealth. Wow. Now, don't quote me on the numbers. I'm plus or minus five. I'm going to be accurate. Um, but, th- but if we can, as an, as an ecosystem, earn the right to 0.1% of that, that wealth pool, we can fund ourselves in perpetuity. We can, we can have pump billions of dollars into yeah. the startup. And remember when we say we pump billions of dollars, what we mean is we give it to founders who and founders spend it on people. Yeah. So it's, that money just goes to creating jobs that don't exist today. And first 10 years of that experiment uh, of taking superannuation money, investing it in startups, and then, and then that, those startups going on to be successful, it looks very, very bright. So the way I think about it is first 10 years, A+. Plus. So 2010 to 2000, well, 2012 to 2022, A+. Plus. But with that comes a lot of pressure. And now there's, what, $3 billion sitting here to deploy over the next three years. So it's just like any founder who raises a round, it's a second of relief. I'm excited I raised the round. And then suddenly the weight of responsibility comes down on you. And so I feel the weight of responsibility. (coughs) So I feel the weight of responsibility to make sure that the next 10 years is just as good. Yep. But looking really promising mm. like you can feel it you guys can you are in the community you are mm. part of you can feel the energy of this community from the founder side from the operator side from the general community side people just interested and then from the investing side it's we're, we're in a position to fund great startups to go and hire thousands of brilliant people yeah so i think it's still an underrated success story but i also feel a massive sense of responsibility is there anything collectively the ecosystem you think needs to work on or any anything holding us back? Like when you think about mentalities in Australian society, like risk off nature's tall poppy syndrome, is there anything holding us back? What do you think? I don't see it. I don't see the hold back. I think I try and compare to Silicon Valley a lot. And so you do see a more risk off nature. You do, do see a bit of tall poppy syndrome, not within the community, but outside of it. In the sense when people become sort of billionaires or they'd be really successful they're not as welcoming and not as sort of cheering them on as in America. And I think a lot of young people I see, people are still really hesitant to not get that foundational grad job um, to take a big sort of risk. That's a good, I agree. I think, yeah, you're probably right. I think I probably look at it inside. I don't think anyone is, no one's playing tall poppy with Mel and Cliff. Like all of us are going, keep going, mm. keep, keep doing this, keep, representing us in this way because this is amazing because when we get to talk about australian founders everyone knows that you exist and canva makes it lassie and not a fluke and that so then we take australian startups really seriously we all come in with a halo off the back of it lassie and canva and then culture and safety culture air wallets immutable so i don't feel the tall poppy syndrome and to the extent there is one from the outside i think that's good for us it helps us build resiliently you know, if, if society is saying justify yourself to us, then let's justify ourselves. Let's explain that we mm. create amazing new high-quality jobs, that we create that, that the most of what we're doing is R&D, inventing new things, that most startups are doing things that are net positive for the world. I'm not saying all startups are impact, but most startups are doing something that's that's a positive for the world. So mm. 
I don't know. I think the job's on us to to sell to the rest of society why this is. We have to because we need more and more talent coming in. Yeah. So but I think you're right. I think all those points are, are fair, but I think the momentum is in the right direction. And and to some extent, the struggle is useful because it forces us to be good. Mm. I think it becomes like a self fulfilling prophecy a little bit when you get smart people coming, other smart people will come. And also, as you said, there's three billion dollars in capital kind of waiting to be deployed. And for, you know, funds to return that back to investors, there has to be a lot of things that, that go right, right? So there has to be people building companies. And I think there's a lot more imperative now to encourage people to build companies as well as not, not just join them, which I think is interesting because I think that's a slight narrative shift. Yeah. When you're in your first stage of an ecosystem, it's all about joining a company. Hey, we want talent that goes to McKinsey to go join a startup. But now I think this next wave is like, hey, you guys can actually build something. And I think that's what Kind speaks to as well. 100%. Yeah, I Again, I think startups are an underrated success story. <clears throat> I think 10 years, hopefully, five or 10 years from now, we'll look back and go, wow, we didn't realise how big and special this was. Yeah. yeah, And there's so much money waiting to be released as well. Like mm. What happens when like Canva IPOs, all the money that trickles down, mm. all the sort of VC sort of syndicates that are going to get started from that, mm. all the new companies. Yeah, when you think all about the, all the funds as well, like when yeah. those funds that money gets returned, all that's the super people's funds super. Mm. That's people's yeah. super. Like that's the ultimate trust. Upper, ultimate recipient of the of the dollar success is super funds. Mm. Yeah. Ev- you know, everyone wins in a small way, but normal people, you know. And who are the big super funds? Host Plus, who represent um, uh, hospitality. So, you know, yeah. a lot of young people, Hester, doctors and nurses. You know, there's. It's awesome. People don't talk enough about the circularity of success here. Mm. And the super funds are super invested in making something succeed here too now. So, mm. again, it all just comes back to us. We have a responsibility. We nail it. We're good for a really long time. If we don't, then shame on all of us. <laughs> yeah, awesome. Should we head into the quick fire? Yeah, let's do it. Awesome. Cool. Quick fire. No <laughs> quick war- fire yeah. I didn't get a warning about this. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of our favourite parts. It's sort of bringing the podcast back to the personal at the end of the episode. So we're going to give you 30 or so seconds to just answer a bunch of different random questions. Go for it. Awesome. What's one of your favourite podcasts and why? You can cut this out while I think about it. I'll give you an episode. It's the Acquired Podcasts uh, benchmark episode that just came out. I the the dev- dinner one or the first one? The first one was better. Yeah. I devoured that. Although the dinner one was super insightful as well. So the Acquired Podcast, I just love that's an episode i listen to so many sports podcasts like i fall asleep every night to ryan rosillo's podcast because he has like his really deep voice that induces me (laughs) to fall asleep so like sometimes i'll be at like two in the morning i'm like who is this man in the room oh it's (laughs) ryan rosillo and i forgot to turn the podcast off so if you're looking to improve your sleep ryan rosillo is both a great sports podcast and highly beneficial for sleep quality (laughs) cool cool check it out What's one of your favourite books and why? Recollections of a Bleeding Heart, which is about Paul Keating, written by his advisor. It's like one of the greatest like pieces of Australian literature. Just the way it's written is stunning. And it is the best, although I think famously Keating was not a fan of it. It's just the best, most real insight into one of the all-time great people in Australian history. Mm and you know one of my personal heroes and it's such a good book so it's called recollections of the bleeding heart and it's yeah i recommend it to everyone i have copies in our melbourne office that i give to people if i get even a scent that they're interested in a little bit in politics (laughs) they're getting recollections awesome we'll have to read that one get ready it's going to take you a while and it's dense like the 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 language use the english language deployment is not it's not a light airy page ripper you're going to be rereading sentences but it's it's stunning Who's someone that you'd love to have dinner with that you've never met? LeBron James. Why is that? He's just, I think, as close to God as a <laughs> human being can <laughs> be. I, I met Carmelo Anthony once, and I think he's 6'11". And the only thing I can compare it to is I lived in Darwin for a year with Jules, and we used to go out um, and we'd go and do croc tours. And when you see a, a large crocodile in real life, you're basically seeing a dinosaur, and your, your brain yeah. can't comprehend something that's like your brain has a model of how big certain things are. Yeah. And when I met Kamal Anthony, like I'm looking up at like this perfectly formed human being, like sp- spatially, but he's so large. Like your brain just, just like glitches. Cause you're like, how, how can, yeah. like, 
because I'm a human being and he's a human being. You're a tall human being. And I'm pretty tall. Mm -hmm. But but how are we, like, the same? Mm. So it's just like, wow. I mean, I I exaggerate with LeBron being close to I do think that's why we love – we can talk about this separately, but I think we love athletes because they do bring us closer to the kind of the impossible. Mm. I just think LeBron's just one of the great all-time stories and – I probably shouldn't say LeBron because you're not meant to meet your heroes, but uh, yeah, LeBron, Paul Keating, mm. who else? That'll do. Cool. Yeah. And then last one from me, what's one of your favourite artists and why? Brett Whiteley, Balcony Number 2, is that the New Museum of New South Wales or the Gallery of New South Wales? Just go stand in front of it. It's just, it just encapsulates everything amazing about sydney and australia and it's a perfect example of timeless australian greatness cool. i'll have to check it out um what's the most amount of coffees you've ever had in the day and why did you have that many it would have been early on in one of the boys just after the boys were born so pro- probably like seven and it would have just been survival and i've blacked out and i haven't remembered the details except <laughs> that it would have been a, a bad couple of days that i was pushing myself through Okay. Um, you spoke before about emotionally regulating yourself and having to kind of build that. What are some of the tactics you use to emotionally regulate? Meditate. Yeah. As close to every day as you can. Exercise as close to every day as you can. I don't drink. Um, and every week on a Friday afternoon, I take two and a half hours to basically write down what happened in the week. And I send it to Jules as kind of the end point, but really it's the process of capturing what have I just been through? Like every week is so full and sometimes it's just like that's my that's my process for going. Here it is. It's out of my head now. It's on paper. I've dealt with it and I can move on and be present this weekend. Does she do that back to you as well? No. <laughs> <laughs> it's on my street. <laughs> I, have to remi- I have to remind her to read them sometimes. <laughs> but yeah, it's such a cr- – that's, that's the getting, it, getting, your, getting the thoughts that are all in your mind out um, is so powerful. Yeah. And last question um, – What's a message that you want to give to all your loved ones? It can be just your loved ones or it can be you know, anyone. The line that comes into my mind is you are enough. And going through coaching, um, one of the lines that I was given by my coach, which you can sort of like an affirmation that you can repeat to yourself in stressful times is, um, if I bring my whole self to this situation, I have everything I need and I'm already enough. But I think that I am already enough piece. Um, it's like a flippant thing to just say, you are already enough. But if you really embrace that, it does give you the freedom to drop the unnecessary stress of every situation and accept whatever you bring to that. Mm. It's a beautiful awesome. way in this episode. Well, Nick, thanks for joining us. Um, we'll probably see you at sunrise. Yeah. And um, yeah, that was I'll amazing. F- I'll be in the crowd looking up to you on the stage. <laughs> I look forward to it. <laughs> that was a really enjoyable conversation. I like that. Cool. Thanks. thanks. Awesome.